Hi, my name is Nate. I'm an electrical engineer, and uh, your computer is made of hardware, and I'm here to remind you about that. Um, so, more specifically, I'm here to talk about side channel attacks by a method called differential power, differential power analysis, wherein we hook up some electrical equipment to the power cable of your computer and then ask your computer to do something and determine what's going on even if you're not supposed to know. So, I said next. Next. There. Okay, so, uh, we often think of a computer as a black box with an input and an output. And typically, when we're talking about security, we're talking about ways that people can exploit inputs and outputs to get uh, information that they're not supposed to have. But those two aren't the only arrows in your computer. There's also a power cable, which happens to send information in both directions. <laughs> because uh, any time that you're consuming power, someone has to be supplying it. And the person supplying it knows that they're supplying it. So um, one really obvious example of this is when PG&E upgraded to the smart power meters. Um, it became a security concern for people having the power consumption information readily accessible and continuously transmitted. Uh, people could see when they had turned the pool on or when they weren't even home. Uh, and so power consumption is an actual problem that we have to make sure isn't just leaking information. And you already know this. Your thigh already knows this. When you're running a GPS on your phone and you uh, put your phone in your pocket, your phone's hot, which means your phone's leaking the information that you're using your GPS, which means your thigh is committing a side channel attack against your phone's GPS. <laughs> um, So what leaks information? <laughs> well, <laughs> so things that leak information. CPU instructions leak information. Different instructions on your processor might consume different amounts of power. So if you do one instruction at one time and another instruction at another, people monitoring how much power your consumer, uh, computer is consuming know which uh, command, which instruction you're running um, to consume varying amounts of power. They also execute in varying amounts of time. So not only can the person monitoring your computer know that you're doing this thing at that time versus another, but they also know how long you're doing that thing. And so if, what, if you're doing that thing for a certain amount of time and that conveys information about what it's doing that thing on, then you're leaking that data simply by how long you're processing it. Peripheral hardware also consumes more power. So if you have a device that has uh, other hardware on it that has to process data or, say, uh, communicate via radio like GPS, then that extra hardware takes more power, and people know that you're using that hardware if you're consuming more power. The code path can also leak data through those other means. So if the sensitive data causes you to do, use one part of your code path versus another, then you are, have a power waveform that is associated with that. So you know one thing is happening at this time versus another, and you can guess at what part of the code you're in because of that. Also, the device just being on. Like I said, with the smart power meter, just having your computer on versus off can leak the fact that you're using the computer and constitute a security risk. So this is all great in theory, but has anyone actually used power differential power analysis to extract private information from a computer? Yes. <laughs> This is Trezor. It's a bit Bitcoin wallet implemented in hardware designed to be a secure, bit, uh, secure wallet outside of your computer. Uh, the problem is it consumes power in order to do so. And someone was able to demonstrate a method to extract the private key from the wallet simply by measuring how much power it was consuming. Uh, and the person who demonstrated this and actually extracted a private key did this great write-up 
Uh, here's a QR code in case you want to see it. It's a really great article. It's fun to, re fun to read. So before we describe how he did it, we have to explain a bit of electrical engineering just so that we have a baseline. Um, if we plug a load into a source, we have the device plugged into power. Um, we want to be able to measure the power that the device is consuming. And the problem with that is uh, the tools we're probably going to use for that are oscilloscopes. And oscilloscopes measure voltage over time. So we want to have some kind of circuit that allows us to measure the voltage at one point in the circuit and get a waveform that is at least roughly proportional to the power consumption. So in order to do that, we'll put a resistor in series with the uh, load. And because the current is the same at all points in the circuit and the power uh, across something is proportional to the voltage across it and the uh, times the current through it, by measuring the voltage across the resistor in series, we have a measurement of the current. And from there, we have at least a rough measurement of the power being consumed by the load. And remember, we don't need to get an exact proportional measurement of the power. All we need to do is see when it's consuming more power and when it's consuming less. So what did he do to get the private key out of the Trezor? Well, he took the Trezor and he spliced a resistor in series with the, uh, with the, in the USB cable. So we have this resistor in series. And then he connected an oscilloscope across the resistor. And he asked the Bitcoin wallet to compute a public key. And through the computation of the public key, it would loop over the bits of the private key and, uh, leak, inf and leak information about the pri private key through the power consumption, through the voltage across the resistor. So when he did it, he got these three waveforms. Here are three different examples of computing the public key. Um, and so he was able to see that when a bit in the private key was one, the algorithm called a certain piece of code that had a characteristic power spike. And so by looking at this for a while, you might eventually see that you have this pattern right there. And so every time that happens, this BN inverse is getting called, and that only happens when a bit in the private key is one. So it's great to see someone else do it, but let's have it actually happen here. So I have an Arduino, and I have some code on the Arduino that's blinking an LED. And yeah, it's not computing a, private, a public key, and we're not going to discover any fantastic uh, differential power analysis attack on AES right here. Um, but I'm just trying to show that through not even touching the device, not even looking at it, because obviously the LED is blinking, um, we're going to be able to tell how fast the LED is blinking. And so in order to do that, we're going to connect a series resistor to the Arduino, just like we did before. And we're going to connect the oscilloscope probe across the resistor. And so what happens next? Right. All right, so we have the series resistor, and we have the Arduino. <laughs> <laughs> And we have the oscilloscope across the series resistor. So let's do that now. And I'll, I'll have the screen on the projector as soon as I get this set up. And there's the wave of power, the, the power consumption wave uh, on the oscilloscope. So you can see it up here. Here's the wave. And you can see by setting the cursors uh, to one period of the wave, we have a time difference of 20 milliseconds. And so we might be able to guess that the uh, this delay might be 10 milliseconds each because it turns the LED on, then turns it off. And so that time is the sum of these two delays. And yes, it is. 
So not even touching uh, the device, just measuring the power consumption, uh, power consumption through the, just the amount of current that the device is drawing. We know that it is doing something for a certain amount of time, and through that leaking some secret, in this case, the number 10. <laughs> so what can we do about the fact that just plugging into the wall leaks information about what the device is doing? Well, first is uh, use strict permissions in the device that, in the design of the device that you're developing. Um, in the case of Trezor, the patch for the device was to require uh, authentication in order to compute a public key. So uh, when they did that, as soon as you tried to extract the private key by measuring the power consumption during the public key computation, uh, you you were automatically at least uh, consenting to leaking that information. So uh, a third party attacker couldn't come along and pick up the device that wasn't theirs and compute a public key and extract the private key just on their own. They had to at least coerce someone into computing a public key. Um, and on top of that, if you can break authentication of your, uh, of your device, then you've, you've already been compromised. If you can break authentication, then you can do other things too. Um, phys uh, physical security is also important. If you stop people from getting to the place where you plug the device into the wall, then you can at least stop them from connecting an oscilloscope to it. And on top of that, uh, in order to stop, say, uh, the smart meter attack, you can design your power supplies to at least filter out some of the fluctuations in power consumption. So if you have, say, a battery backup inside of your power supply, then you're not uh, uh, consuming power directly from the wall, and you can recharge the battery as needed. Or you can put a uh, low-pass filter in your power supply and stop it from leaking the minor fluctuations that would allow you to see the fine detail of what the um, uh, processor is consuming. Um, and you can also use software algorithms to mitigate these kinds of attacks, uh, which are on the next slide. Oh yeah, also, just in general be aware that just because you're doing something in secret on your computer doesn't mean that other people can't see it if they have access to it. So. What exactly kind of countermeasures can we implement in our devices, both in hardware and software? Well, the first thing is there uh, a thing called LMDPL, which is lookup table masked dual rail with precharge logic, uh, which is essentially just uh, do both things at once. So if you have data that is processing something based on whether it's a one or a zero, then uh, ask it to com compute both at once, and then just take the result of the one that you actually meant to. Um, on the software side, there are two techniques called, techniques called masking and shuffling, which are both essentially splitting your sensitive data into parts, hopefully linearly combinable parts, and then running the computation on each part separately. And by ensuring that people don't have access to every single part of the computation, or at least uh, can't consume all that information and process it back into a uh, single lump, then at least you've uh, mitigated the possibility of doing some power analysis and figuring out what the data originally was. Uh, and a whole bunch of other industry secrets, which uh, I'm not allowed to even mention who they might even be because I was told I'm not allowed to mention it. <laughs> I was like, can I mention you? And no, no. <laughs> so, yeah, questions? Max. Um, you did reference this in terms of uh, things that you can't talk about, mm -hmm. but um, is there anything that you can't talk about which are like implementation-specific uh, countermeasures that aren't obfuscation? I guess the dual rail thing kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I'd say on the hardware side, uh, just uh, making the actual logic circuit in on the silicone, uh, silicon, not silicone, uh, on the silicon, uh, do mul multiple things at once, uh, regardless of what data it's processing, is one way that's just not obfuscation. And 
Uh, if I knew more about masking and shuffling, I would be able to say it's not obfuscation, it's just linear combination, superposition. Um, but I couldn't read the entire academic paper that I was able to find. <laughs> so not, that, that's my answer. Any other questions? The oscilloscope will be here if you, in case you want to see the actual waveform. Uh, and otherwise, thank you for listening.